I'm now delighted to introduce today's Energy and Transition keynote speaker. Dr. Lawrence Jones is Vice President, International Programs at the Edison Electric Institute, which he joined in September last year. His previous role was with Alstom Grid as North American Vice President for Utility Innovation and Infrastructure Resilience. Dr. Jones also has served as Alstom's Vice President Policy, Regulatory Affairs, and Industry Relations. He also serves on a number of US and international industry advisory committees. He is co-chair of the 21st Century Power Partnership Leadership Program and is a member of the US Department of Commerce's Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Advisory Committee. Dr. Jones grew up in Liberia and later lived and studied in Sweden, where he gained his Master of Science in Electricity Engineering and his doctorate in Power Systems Engineering. Dr. Jones is now based in North America. We're very pleased to have Dr. Jones join us here in Adelaide today to deliver his keynote address. Please welcome him to the stage. Good morning. Good morning. Ah, that's much better. Well, thank you, Ben, for that introduction, and, and thanks again to uh, John and others for inviting me. This is uh, probably my 12th uh, visit to Australia, and uh, perhaps my, I think it's my third visit to Adelaide. The longest stay in Adelaide was this, this week, and I really enjoyed it here. Um, and um, I'm, I'm hoping to come back here, uh, because a lot is happening in South Australia. Listen to the minister, uh, I always wanted to think if I should even move here now, because uh, uh, you guys are uh, preparing for a very interesting uh, roller coaster ride, uh, which is one way to describe transition. Uh, as Ben said, I'm with Edison Electric Institute. Uh, Edison Electric Institute is a, a trade association with about 200 investor-owned utility members in the U.S. We also have about uh, 70 members internationally, and, and uh, I run that program where those members are in about 57 countries. So my life is between home and an airplane, uh, but uh, it, it's fun. So what I'd like to do uh, this morning, uh, we've heard a lot of presentations uh, thus far about transition. Uh, we've heard about, the minister talked about the transition going on. Um, I didn't know I was getting myself in the middle of a political season, but uh, um, I guess given where I'm coming from, I should be sort of uh, immune to this sort of a discussion. Uh, so what I'd like to do is step back a little bit and, and as a keynote presenter, you don't want to get into too much of the minutia. You want to provoke, uh, you want to at least uh, generate some ideas on the part of those who will be speaking after me, uh, and also uh, give you, the audience, something to reflect on. And so some of what I will say uh, might be provocative, uh, which is something I know John wanted me to do. Uh, some might be inspirational, and, and some might require you to probably you know, exit me straight to the airport and have me leave uh, Australia today. Um, I've titled my talk, Energy Industry in Transition, Many Pathways to a Shared Future. And uh, listening to the minister, he talked about you know, multiple uh, alternatives and what have you. But I, I would like for you, as we go through my, my, my presentation, to uh, step away from Australia for a moment and think about the last two words, shared future, and how that fits in into this whole notion of the energy transition. Um, obviously, see this works, there you go. We have a lot of changes ahead of us. And uh, change is a good thing, I love change. Uh, and, and I think change is very, um, sort of a, the best way to describe this transition is that change is inevitable. And because change is inevitable, you need to ask yourselves, so why are we even changing? I mean, what's wrong with this system that we need to transition from one to another? Um, the, lo the local dimension of the energy transition is something the minister talked about. If you think about it, we're a global world, right? We're in Paris sign an agreement, and so we're all thinking about the world, we have a shared future, right? So the energy transition is global in its sort of a scope, but in essence, it's also local in character. You have one situation here in South Australia, you have another one in Queensland, you'll have another one in different parts of this country and also in different parts of the world. Now what that means is how we approach this will require us to step back and ask ourselves, what are the local conditions in our respective countries? 
And when you look at the transition, the other thing that's interesting is the world today has about two billion people who don't have access to electricity. Two billion people. And if those individuals are to get out of poverty, what should be their energy transition? What should be their source of energy? Should we think that perhaps the best way for them is to leapfrog to clean energy? Maybe. But it costs money. So are we going to see them maybe going back and using conventional fuel because they have to get out of poverty? Perhaps. So these are things we need to think about globally when we talk about this energy transition. Although it's very interesting to keep focus on the local conditions, we live in a globalized world. And if dealing with energy poverty is a global issue, perhaps some parts of the world will continue to use conventional fuel, maybe coal, because they have to get out of poverty. Does it mean that they have a different transition pathway? Are we in the developed world, perhaps, transitioning to clean energy, but wanting them to also transition, which means if they do the same transition, their industrialization may not go as fast as ours. Because in fact, we may not even be transitioning today if we were underdeveloped. In fact, if we're underdeveloped, we'll probably still use coal because it will help us to boost our industrialization. But now that we're developed, we can say, let's go to clean energy because it's probably the best thing to do now. So the rest of the world, two billion people, what do they do? How do they transition? Who pays for that transition? Change takes time. And this discussion about the energy transition, I've heard about it in, in almost every country I've traveled the last couple of months. Everyone is talking about the transition. Well, change takes time. Now, some people want it to go very fast. Others want it to go slow. Will it be evolutionary? Will it be disruptive? We don't know. But what we do know is that it takes time. We have a common goal. When you talk to utility executives around the world, energy executives, they all say, the three key goals, reliability, sustainability, and affordability. How do you offer those three, how do you meet those three goals? And what does it mean for you as a utility executive, as a country, as a region, in meeting those goals? Because those are the goals we share as a planet. We all want everyone to have reliable, sustainable, and affordable electricity. So the, the goals are many but also are the path. We may share the same goals. The minister talk about a low carbon economy. Almost every OECD country has a goal to have a low carbon economy. The question is, how do we get there? Cleaner energy, we all want it. How do we get there? Universal access to energy. How do we achieve that? So the goals are multiple, but so are the pathways. So there are three questions I want you to think about. The first one, so what is the role of your company in the energy transition? Whatever your company is along the entire value chain, you may be a, you know, a retailer, distributor, generator, whatever it is, what is the role your company is going to play? Is your company prepared for the transition? And I will talk a little bit about what I think is how you prepare for the transition. And then also, what will be the regulatory framework going forward as the transition occurs. Well, at some point, you either adapt and you innovate, or you get vaporized. I didn't say die. I said get vaporized. Vaporization takes time. It's not going to happen fast. And if you think about it, one of the slides that Basil showed yesterday, the last slide in his, his, his presentation, talked about a lot of big companies that eventually got vaporized. Vaporization is going to occur because of digitalization. So it's not going to happen fast. In fact, as we sit here, if you check, maybe you already are vaporizing, you just don't know it. Perhaps. And who's going to vaporize you? You, don't, you do not know, but it's going to occur. So you have to think about how you adapt and how you innovate. There are a lot of opportunities with regards to this transition. There are a lot of challenges, but I'm an optimist. I don't like to spend too much time on all the challenges. I believe the next panel and the following discussions will deal with the challenges. The opportunities in the transition are real. The question is, how do you harness it? 
going back to my first question, how are you preparing to cope with the transition? And there are a couple of ways. Having this idea of a vision and a strategy is something everyone talks about. You need a vision for the transition. You need to have a plan and a strategy. You need to address one issue that the minister talked about. It's what I call the economics of the transition. What is it going to cost? Who's going to pay? Who's going to lose? Because there will be losers. There will be entities that will get vaporized. Perhaps not you yet, because now I've told you not to get vaporized, so you will make sure you avoid being vaporized. But there will be some that will disappear. And the issue of resiliency, very interesting. Wherever I travel in the world, everyone is talking about resilience, especially in the USA after Superstorm Sandy, parts of Europe, parts of uh, Latin America, where you have drought. Everyone is talking about resilient systems. Well, who pays for resiliency? It's not cheap. It shouldn't be for free. We pay for reliability. So why not pay for resilience? And who pays for it? The value chain is going to get disrupted. There will be beneficiaries. And again, like I said, there will be losers. But your strategy has to be focused on those two boxes. One, understanding the economics of the transition. And two, being able to understand where in the value chain you want to sit. Now, the challenge about our industry is that the value streams of this industry, unlike other industries, are challenged by regulation. The value streams of this industry are challenged by regulation. So in essence, what I'm saying is that you cannot see this industry as a normal industry. Because the things we do are challenged by the policies and the regulation around which our businesses must operate. So the forces at work here, they're complex, but they're also interrelated. And the next panel will talk about technology. I believe there will be discussions already about policy and regulation and markets. These are interrelated forces that are at play here. They're different around the world. They're having different impacts around the world. But we need to understand these three forces or sets of forces. Mixing politics. Regulation and economics doesn't always go hand in hand with Kirchhoff's law, Amper's law, Moore's law, and even Metcalf's law. This is the only engineering thing I'm going to say today, by the way. But I had to say it because oftentimes, as an engineer, I am frustrated when the rules that are put on my grid and the economic theories that I apply to my grid defies the laws of Kirchhoff, defies the laws of Amper. And so the question is, why is it that as an industry, we're perhaps one of the only industry that have built the most complex system that has worked well, but all of a sudden, as part of the transition, we're told that we have to allow other laws to regulate and to come and make this system work, like you know, the legal framework, beautiful word, legal framework, and policy. These things have nothing to do with physics. I would argue that if you remove all of the regulation, you remove all of the economics, and just let the system work, the system will work as it has worked for 100 years. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have these other things, regulation and economic theories. I call them theorists because sometimes it's hard to prove. And you know that's something we need to think about. And we see this around the world. People are constantly trying to mix regulation and policy with physics. And it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, guess who they blame? Ha <laughs> ha. They blame the engineers. You guys go make it work. But how often do you see the regulation and the policies being changed and admittedly changed, that we made a mistake with the regulation. Your grid was working perfectly well. We tried to force an economic theory into the grid. It didn't make sense. It's not your fault, engineers. It's not your fault, utilities. Our economic theories just didn't work. And our policy didn't make sense. And we've seen places around the world where there's been mistakes with regards to policy and regulation, where the physics of the grid would have worked if they had just been left by itself. 
So how we design markets for electricity is a very tricky proposition. I believe in markets, but I believe in markets for true commodities. Commodities that are not sort of uh, constrained by regulation and policy. So electricity is, I've said this publicly and I will say it here again and people might tweet and say I said it so I can't hide myself. I've said this publicly, this is my view, it's not EEI's view or it's not anyone else who knows me. So everyone here who knows me should disavow me after I make this statement. Electricity is the only commodity that its value is perceived higher when it's not there. When it's gone, everybody wants to pay a lot for electricity. And once it comes back, we're told to make it affordable and cheap. So I don't understand. My iPhone bill is much higher than my electricity bill. I value my electricity, but I can't pay what I would like to pay, maybe, I guess, because guess what? It has to be constrained, it has to be affordable. So what kind of a market is that where the, the commodity cannot actually be priced the way it should be priced? The reason is because electricity also offers a social good. So, cell phone bills are higher and no one cares. Electricity bills cannot get higher because of the complexity around electricity. So our message as an industry about our transition has to focus still on the four core principles. Safety, who can keep it safe? Utilities, regulatory bodies, can give us rules and instructions. At the end of the day, safety comes first. And that's what the utilities and energy companies have been doing for decades. So as we bring about the transition, ask yourself the question, does the regulatory framework pre present itself a challenge to making sure that the accountability for unsafe practices is also taken care of? Or as we have in some countries that I visited recently, when things go wrong, the very same people who said they didn't want the utilities involved only call the utilities. So, safety, reliability, affordability, and clean. So the message we give to our customers have to reflect those four basic principles. But we also have to be realistic. Going back to my chameleon, we have to be a bit adaptive, we have to innovate, and we have to realize that change is inevitable. And as we look at change, how we communicate to our customer has to get away from just talking about electricity and price, but start focusing on value. Explain to them why is this thing that is called the grid so important? And what is the value of the grid? Whether it is the electricity grid or the gas networks, whatever the network is, we have to explain it. So customers are changing. They've always been individualized, but for some reason, because of technology, everyone has his own iPhone or multiple iPhones, so all of a sudden we're saying, let's individualize customer service. And so again, you're coming to this grid and you're telling us to create a same environment for electricity as you have for cell phones. So I should have my, I call it my e-phone in my hand, my electrical phone, whatever it is, and I would like to sort of a commoditize reliability. So I'm going to give Lena here maybe you know, one certain amount of reliability, and she'll pay me for that, and I'll give my friend Basil a certain amount of reliability. That cannot happen. The system is what it is. Reliability is a social good. We all benefit from it. So how do we commoditize something that is supposed to be useful for everybody? So when people say create customized services, customized products for the customer, what am I supposed to productize? I cannot give one person less reliability than the other. I could, but then the regulation will tell me I have to take care of everybody in terms of a universal access. So as we look at customer services, getting away from just the product and looking at the services is becoming very interesting. There's going to be the panel this afternoon about who offers certain kinds of services and who should and who shouldn't. Because customers want choice. I don't really believe customers really want choice. Customers have, to be, have been made to believe that they want choice. Again, another Lawrence Jones views. People are made to believe they want choice. I think customers really want convenience. I don't even think they want control. Because it's difficult to control my, my, you know, my uh, 
a touch TV at home, the most advanced one, I can't, I can't control it. I don't want control. I just want convenience. And so how do you offer convenience as a utility in this transition? What are you going to do to make your customers feel convenient in terms of how you offer them these different services? Individualization is interesting. On the one hand, individualized services. On the other hand, you're saying to them, let's come together and aggregate. First, we should disaggregate, be individualized. And then we say, well, I'm too small to take advantage of the grid. So let's create community services. And maybe as a community, we can sort of interact with the grid. So the value chain, how we create value, how we deliver it, how we capture it. It's been great. It's been working for a while. But it's going to get disrupted. As we look at the costs and the effect of the choices we make, the minister talked about choice and some of the choices that have been made here. We've seen choices made around Europe and elsewhere in the world. Those choices have consequences. And value is being destroyed. We've seen it where the wrong choice, even if the intent was right, the goal was right, the time the decision was made was wrong. And we're seeing it now. Look at Europe. Just look at the value of some of the largest European utilities. Their stock value has fallen. Now, you can say they did not follow my friend the chameleon and adapt. But you could also say that they were forced to adapt quicker because of a policy decision that was made that they were not sort of a planning for. So you can't say that the guys who built nuclear were wrong because the government said they wanted base load and they said build. So comes Fukushima and said, oh, by the way, we made a mistake. We don't want you to build nuclear. So because of that, we're now saying, hey, guess what? Do something else. High penetration renewable, very great. But when we were making investments in base load, we didn't have all this renewable. Now, I'm not arguing that one is good or one is bad. I'm just saying that the decisions we make have consequences. And so you don't want to destroy value in these companies. Because by the way, these companies, many of them offer jobs. They pay taxes, huge taxes. And so there are unintended consequences when you do this sort of a, a disruption to the value chain. And it affects the companies, but it also affects society. I'll talk about three things that I see which haven't come up so far at the conference, and it may come up the rest of the day. One is urbanization. I talked about the population around the world being at, you know, two billion people with access to electricity. You have mega cities, lagas in, in Africa. You have uh, 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 Seoul in Korea. You have Beijing. All these mega cities. You know what's interesting? If I came from space and I wasn't a human, I would ask myself the question, why has God given humans such vast land and they have chosen to all live on only 25% of the land they've been given in a place that they're compact? So it's, it's just strange. We're urbanizing. We're making ourselves less resilient. And why? What does that mean for the energy transition that we're all going to be living in these very clustered areas? But by the way, just remember, at least in Europe I know for a fact, I don't know much in Australia in terms of what I'm about to say. Everyone in Europe who says they believe in urbanization has a summer house. And do you know why they go to the summer house? One, they can afford it, but the reason they go there is because they want to re vitalize themselves. They want to get out of the rush in the city. They want to go someplace and just sort of regroup and regain their energy and come back after the summer. So I had a conversation with a, uh, 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 one of those uh, leaders in London a couple of months ago at a smart city conference. And I asked him, I said, how many summer homes do you have? He said, I have none. I said, why? He said, I believe in, I believe in uh, urbanization. I said, great. What do you do in the summer? Well, my wife has a summer house. <laughs> So, so, you know, the energy transition and urbanization is very interesting. So you have the situation. Here is the largest, uh, one of the largest uh, uh, smart city project being built uh, in South Korea, in Songbu, $35 billion. Brand new city. Imagine the energy need in that city. What does this mean for the energy transition? 
You know, you got to have these kinds of cities popping up all over the place. The other thing that's very interesting is the transportation. Electrification is now being seen as probably the best fuel for doing a lot of the things we would like to do. So why not electrify transportation? That would make sense. And if we do that, we have some uh, results in the US that shows that from a utility perspective, if you're concerned, you know, I think Basil talked about it yesterday and a couple of others about, you know, sort of a, the study of flat growth in terms of demand and, and all that. How do we sort of grow the base in terms of demand? Well, electrification. Just look at this chart. You see over time, you can start seeing growth in your, in your load through electrification and other forms of services that will become electrified. But remember, the utilities who will electrify or go into electrification should not go there trying to sell kilowatt hours. They should want to buy, actually buy the gas stations, convert the gas station to charging stations, and get in the real estate business. Just something for the regulators. They're still utilities. They're just extracting value somewhere else on the value chain. So don't, uh, I'm going to use another word that would get me in trouble here, but don't ring fence them, by the way. Because at the end of the day, value is flowing. Let the utilities experiment where they can capture the value. There is no need to box them in the corner because guess what? You need them in the long run to make sure you have clean, affordable, reliable. So find a mechanism to create sort of the right competitive environment, but don't box them in. So electrification doesn't mean you will just sort of come and let other people own the charging stations. No, you want to own the charging stations. And we're seeing that in the US. In, North, in Canada, Hydro-Quebec is deploying about 600 charging stations in Canada and north in the northern part of the US. The last thing I will talk about here is energy storage. And oh my god, now we find a panacea. It's going to solve everything. Energy storage is going to make everything solvable. No more problems. Right? Wrong. Because, again, it's going to have to be part of a system. There is value from energy storage along the entire value chain of electricity. You see it here. The big debate in that little line I drew, bop, 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 the dotted line, I call it the invisible boundary, because why is it even there? Why not move it? You know, this notion of behind a meter. Again, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but again, John asked me to give a keynote, so that's what you get. You know, the invisible boundary. Why is the meter where the meter is? Why not move the meter to the right or the left? I don't care. But don't be so fixed on the notion of the boundary. The boundary was put in place 100 years ago. You didn't have smart meters. You didn't have wireless sensors. So why, if the technology is moving the industry, why can't technology also move the boundary? I don't know. But we need to think about that. So ladies and gentlemen, why do I spend my time thinking about this energy transition thing? Why? Well, first of all, about 15 years ago, I had a conversation with my father. And then 10 years ago, he died. He was an engineer, hence my brainwashing. Uh, and before he died, three days before he died, he called me in his room and he said, son, promise me one thing. I said, what, dad? I wasn't married at the time, so I'm, a fee I'm, a I'm assuming he's about to tell me, get married. I didn't have kids, and I'm assuming he's going to tell me, have some kids. He said, whatever you do, make sure you help to bring electricity to Africa. He died two days later. And this has been something that has sort of followed me for the last decade. And so for me, the energy transition is not just about OECD countries moving from dirty energy to clean energy. It's also about getting people out of poverty and how that indirectly impacts what happens in OECD countries. Because the more people that get out of poverty, the more opportunities for you to sell all the technology and goods you develop. The other thing is, since my father didn't tell me to go and have kids, I still did. And for me, as we discuss the transition, every time I see my kids, the boys, they're, they're twins, by the way. They both look like their mother, thank goodness. Um, and so does my daughter. But the issue is, as we have this discussion, let's remember it's not about us. It's not about what I do 10 years from now or what you do. It's about them. 
And the more we think about them, the more we should rationalize and be very realistic in the assumptions we make about helping not just our children, but children across the world. So to wrap things up, obviously, multiple transition pathways. There's no one size that will fit everything. Everyone has a different approach. There are certain basic tenets that are basically universal across the board, and we need to keep that in mind. But at the end of the day, this whole discussion, the debates in Australia, the debates in the US, the debates in Sweden, the debates in London, the debates all over the world, from my viewpoint, has to do with one thing. I'm on the other side of that bridge, and you on the other side. I need to come to you. What's keeping me from coming to you? What's keeping us from coming closer? In spite of the little gap that's between us, there's a line, there's a rope that could bring us together. But for that to happen, we have to trust each other. And trust doesn't mean you can't compete. Trust means you take the bigger view when you look at the energy transition. And you ask yourselves, I can compete with you, yes, but on a broader scale, if we look at what's our shared value, we can only get there at some point by reaching consensus. And to reach consensus, we have to trust each other. I've been to Australia probably 12 times in the last decade. I love coming here because whenever I come here, I have the best wine that I drink. I hadn't come to Adelaide. Now I'm in Adelaide. I will only come to Adelaide because I think I've been told they have some of the best wine. I, I don't know. I have been told. But trust is important. And the debates I'm hearing in Australia, I heard similar debates in New Zealand. I've heard them in Sweden, all over the place. Oftentimes, is that there is a way to bring us together. There's a rope. But we just don't trust each other. I'm going to get screwed by you. You're going to get screwed by me. I want to maximize everything for me. Well, it's not going to work that way. We're going to have to give and take. So I end with Mr. Edison, because I like what he said. That vision, and we have a lot of vision. But if the execution is wrong, then we're either on drugs or something, but we're still hallucinating as a people. Thank you. Thank you.